Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. And in this episode, we'll be discussing pop culture events that still resonate with us to this day. These are times where it seemed the entire world was honed in on one thing, and we were all excited for it for varying reasons. Let's get into it. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today, I'm a fellow hose, Amanda Sink. Hello, hello. Troy Heinrichs. I still can't get number one. <laughs> <laughs> Sucker. And uh, John Davenport will not be here this week. He had he had puppy duty. He had some yeah, puppies. Yeah, he's on puppy duty. <laughs> like puppies. jury duty, but puppies. Yep. <laughs> and Troy, you were technically late to than but, me. So I, that, that was what we said. Whoever whoever comes on last gets talked about. Last. Yeah, it's, there it's you all go. good. See, don't uh, worry. It'll be me the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, the last shall be first. Oh my God! You know we're we're pretty close to the Meg too. I, I'm very very excited for, for for that. Dear Lord, I'm almost ashamed for how excited I am for Meg too. You it's, should you should be just a little bit. You're getting on Dave McGraw levels. It's probably out by the time uh, you hear this, but uh, which just picture I am definitely in a theater right now, probably an IMAX to watch the Meg. Please please wear a shark costume. Sure. To why it. wouldn't I? Why wouldn't Why wouldn't I wear a shark costume? <laughs> I wouldn't look like a total It'd be imbecile. Hilarious. A total It'd be so imbecile. Funny. I'll wear some shark jammies, right? With footies. Please do it. Please do it. I would I would actually buy you a shark costume if you would wear it to the movie theater. That's just not gonna happen. <laughs> uh well, last week we went uh pretty long on the whole Barbie incident. And this week we're actually the whole episode is devoted to to one topic, basically spawned from the idea of Barbenheimer or Barbieheimer or whatever the hell it was, but Barbenheimer. There you go. That one, the idea of, Hey, everybody is excited about the same thing at the same time, which just doesn't happen very often, but it's a cool moment in time when it does. And, and that's what we're, we wanted to talk about. Just, just have a whole episode on it. It'll probably be a, a shorter episode. Suck it up. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, the, there's not um, <laughs> much I can do about that because this is the topic we're talking about. That's it. This is actually a, a gift to you to not have to listen to the three of us for longer than just it this It really topic. is. We're really trying to hone it in. We're going to make each episode about six minutes long by, by the end of the year. That's the, the plan. <laughs> and that's that's after editing. Pre-editing, it's still going to be three hours of recording time. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be Aaron chopping out segments of Troy and I until it's just Aaron and John talking. Yep. And that's how the episode gets to six minutes. Yeah, I wish John would have would have stuck around and, we, and been able to do it. He was actually here for the episode, and then his dogs just wouldn't stop. And apparently, you're supposed to treat them with respect or something. So, yes, love them and protect them. I just open the door and say, "I hope you come back." <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> is that cold? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's not nice. It's not Sorry. warm. Sorry. Uh, but if you want to find out more about The Hollywood Outsider and some reviews and whatnot, go to thehollywoodoutsider.com. That's thehollywoodoutsider.com. And you can always support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the Hollywood Outsider. I want to give a shout out to our new patron, Laura Tucker. Welcome. Ah, welcome. Welcome, Laura. Thanks for contributing. I hope you're enjoying the bonus content. There's a lot of bonus content out there. We have Bad Movie Night once a month. And by the time you hear this, we should have had the Bad Movie Night with the first Meg on there. We're... I was not part of that. I can't wait to listen to it. Boom, there you go. Let's get to our topic. You guys ready for this? I'm as ready as I'm going to get. All right. Barbieheimer or Barbenheimer, whatever. <laughs> I it was going to say, you're going to give Troy an aneurysm. It was, a, it was an actual thing. Those movies are just doing bonkers business still, even as we record this. And we did review both movies on last week's episode. So if you want to find out more about that, you can. But it's also something that happens very, very rarely, an actual collision of ideals where everyone wants to watch the same thing at the same time. You can think of this in terms of uh, recent moments like Avengers Endgame, right? We were all on the same page for, for Endgame, or the a vast majority of the public, entertainment public. The Game of Thrones finale, everybody was watching. Regardless of the outcome, we were excited to see it. And uh, this means it's not just an event for you or your friends, but the entire world seems to be in on it too. Like you just run into people in the street or you go to the office or you're at the gas station or 
whatever. And people are talking about the same thing. It's wild when it happens and it doesn't happen very often. And you know, the last couple of weeks it has happened. People were wearing pink and fedoras, both seeing both films in the same day. It was insane. So let's talk about it. What have been the most impactful pop culture events in entertainment for you? And we're going to, we're going to go round Robin. We'll each, we'll just do one at a time. That way, you know, we're not uh, just doing lists or anything like that, but just let's talk about them where the world and you seem to be on the same page, regardless of how it turned out. Troy, you could start. We'll start with back to the future two, because we all watched back to the future one. And then we were like, at the end of the movie, it's like to be continued. And then there was nothing about it. Zero zilch for years. Mm-hmm. And then they finally announced that they were going to make Back to the Future 2 and Back to the Future 3 at the same time and release them very closely in the same, I think it actually came out in the same year. It was not really close within 12 months. And I just remembered the Back to the Future 2, like getting tickets and getting seats. It was like, I think the fifth attempt before my family actually got tickets to see it because everybody wanted yeah, to everybody. see Back to the Future 2. Yeah, everybody wanted to see it. It was, it was huge. It. Huge. And... The only one, see, this is the downside with that memory is because I have it tainted in my head because I did not like the second one at all. Yeah, because the movie ended up stinking. Yeah, and, and that tainted it for me because that was, I remember being stoked for it as a kid and just, I couldn't wait to see it. And you knew six months later you were getting another one and you're like, oh man, they're going to have like this. We we had one for several years and now we're getting two and like within a year span, this is going to be awesome. And it was not at all. But you're right. When the, when the second one came out, everybody was stoked for that second one. Oh, it's too bad that it just didn't deliver. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are funny. You're funny. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> what do you got, Amanda? Give us a, give us a, po- we're going to go around Robin. So, you know, okay. You go I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the easy one first. Okay. okay. All right. Easy one. Let's go. Easy one. <laughs> Harry Potter Me- finale. Oh, now did that one deliver in your eyes? I think it delivered in my eyes for sure. So tell us about I mean, that experience. Come on. Yeah, I I had been I know I had still been working at the movie theater um, when that one came out, I believe. I'm pretty sure anyway. Um, so I remember working like midnight shows for Harry Potter and I didn't get to experience the midnight experience for Harry Potter, but I saw all the fandom that came with it. And I love the movies and I got excited to do my part of the job, which was making the announcements before all of them. And I think I've told the story of me like zipping between, you know, all 12 different midnight showings that were happening one minute consecutively after another. But when I finally got to go to see the last Harry Potter, there was just something about it. There was something about, you know, everyone's collective experience with seeing this franchise come to its end, have it come to a closure and see, you know, how they would put that on the screen, even though we knew kind of what was going to happen in some capacity. So I don't know. It's just, it's that, it's that like synchronization with, with other audience members when it's a completely sold out theater. Like those are the experiences that I really, really love going to the movies for. And and people, I mean, that that's an amazing experience just in the the whole scope of everything right you got eight movies same cast i can't believe that they managed to keep all the, the three main kids the whole time like not yeah. one of them got in to do an acid off a stripper's back or anything i mean like n- nobody <laughs> just truly got arrested or did anything insane i mean that was wild and they all seem like good people still And for me, I got to grow up with those characters on the screen. So it was really cool to like basically see people that were my age doing really cool things that I could never dream of, you know, because they don't exist and they're not real. Spoiler alert. But that was also another cool part of the experience was there was an entire generation of people who grew up with those three characters with Ron, Harry and Hermione and those actors. And so you kind of, I don't know, you kind of build like a collective experience with them. Troy, did you care about Harry Potter? I mean, I cared about Harry Potter and I was very disappointed in the finale because I felt like they didn't need to split the last two movies into two movies. Could have been, I can see that trimmed down. Same thing happened. God, that is your, get it tattooed on your forehead. That's your (laughs) motto, your life motto. This could have been 20 minutes shorter. 
No, the, at the, the end of every meeting, I guarantee you, Troy's like, this meeting could have been 20 minutes shorter. <laughs> it could have been an email. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> That's you. No, I, there's just, there was, there's some extended things in the penultimate, and then there's just some drag out parts in the finale that you could have just really tight two and a half hour movie would have been great. It's not my favorite one of the franchise, but I think that that's when we talk about the experience of the the entertainment event rather than just the film itself. Like it, it is a phenomena, phenomena, phenomena. The, other, the other one I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to mention in of. conjunction with Harry Potter. It's not one I got excited about. Well, but you're, you're ruining the whole idea of Rowan Robin. I know. I know. They I know, better I be know. connected here. But I have to I have to at least mention this because the other massive franchise that occurred while I was working at the movie theater was Twilight. And you had grandmothers and I'm not joking about this grandmothers who are in retirement, who are coming in in crop tops that say Team Jacob or Team Edward. I specifically remember these two grandmothers who are wearing you, these. Outfits. You can't see it, but but Troy just fanned himself because he's getting hot. <laughs> That's yeah. what the grandmothers were doing. They were like, oh, oh read man. some more vampire wave werewolf. The, no. Wave that social security check on my face. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Rub that Bengay on my back, baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jacob, you're going to be the Batman someday. <laughs> but it was kind of like the the equivalent, I don't know, of like, I guess, Barbie for right now. The most recent example I could provide you with would be Barbie, where you have just swarms of women flocking in to go see a movie and they're going with their best friends and, you know, their group of girls and they're dressing up and they're just really bought in into I, the consumerism side of this fandom for these franchises. And I think that, I don't know, I just still think it's really cool regardless of if you align with the movie and you think it's great or not. I thought it was a cool experience and I didn't even like Twilight. <laughs> right? Yeah. I remember going to see the last one and and it was... People were really, really stoked, and I, I didn't care one way or the other. But you know, I missed like I think several <laughs> of the movies, and I still enjoyed <laughs> the last one. I didn't know what was going on. I still like ah, this is bad. That was probably one of the times where you went to get like a popcorn refill, and you bump into someone you know, and you just start talking for thirty minutes. Yeah, and then kinda. you come back, and your wife was like, "Where were you?" And you were like, "I ran into Jason from down the street." Kinda. Yeah. Kinda. And you know what? Speaking of pop culture events like Barbenheimer, and because we love movie theaters more than anyone, I want to talk to you real quick. Because are you heading to the movies? You can reserve your seat before the show on Fandango. So you can find times, you can read reviews, you can buy tickets to your favorite theater fast and easy on the Fandango app, or you can go to Fandango.com. You can see what's playing near you, watch the trailers, grab your seat. All that's left is choosing butter or no butter when you buy popcorn. And sometimes that's a tough decision. Every movie, every feeling, every time. That's Fandango. Your one-stop shop before showtime. You can buy your movie ticket now on the Fandango app or at Fandango.com. And we even want to help you get to the theater. That's how much we want to support the movie theater using Fandango.com. We're giving away five digital codes of up to $15 off movie tickets via Fandango. 15 bucks off movie tickets if you use Fandango.com. We're giving away five of those. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. So if you want to enter, if you want a chance to win one of five digital codes, all you have to do is send an email to contests at the hollywoodoutsider.com. That's contests at the hollywoodoutsider.com with the subject line Fandango with your name and your favorite all-time movie theater experience. And then we'll enter you in a drawing to win, which winners will be notified by email. Got it? All right, everybody. Let's get on with the rest of the show. Well, mine, I'm going to connect. Uh, it's actually the same property but two different spans of time. The The first would be 1989 when the original Batman came out. And Amanda, you probably weren't even born when that happened. I was not. Uh, but what happened was there were... You happened because of that movie. <laughs> yeah, your parents were like doing it right after a Batman. Couple, yeah, a couple years later, they were doing a rewatch and they were like, like man. Like, Vale, Vicky Vale. Michael Keaton is my favorite. Oh. <laughs> He's not like Jacob, though. <laughs> No, I would much rather them have done it to like Jurassic Park, but I came out that year, so that's okay. That's wild. <laughs> that's, that's weird. <laughs> anyway, so both me and Jurassic Park came out in 1993. <laughs> uh, 89, Batman, 
we we really hadn't seen comic book movies succeed since uh, Superman two, really, because the other Superman movies. Well, 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 well. So we had this new vision, Tim Burton, who was really hot at the time. We had a weird cho- choice for for Bruce Wayne and Michael Keaton, but people were still stoked because you had Prince doing the soundtrack, you had a very gothic feel and vibe, and there were people, and you can't picture this anymore, but there were people lined around the mall. Yeah, it was a mall. It was definitely malls across America where movie theaters were located, and they were lined all the way through the mall. You would actually see the line going all the way through an entire mall. You remember this, Troy? Like this period mm-hmm. of time? It was wild. Same with Return of the Jedi. Same kind of experience. And everybody wanted to see the, these, these movies. And it was just, we were in awe. I mean, it happened with Return of the Jedi too, but this Batman is specifically what I'm talking about. And it was just wild to see that character come back to life and see him on the big screen. I'd never really seen him. We'd only seen the jokey, ridiculous version of, of the TV iteration. And here we go. We got Tim Burton. He brought him to life, made Batman real and interesting. And then many, many years later, we had the Dark Knight where people were on the same page again. People were stoked. People were excited. We had Midnight Shows. This is before the Dark Knight Rises ruined Midnight Shows. The Dark Knight had so many people just ecstatic. Everybody was into Heath Ledger. Everybody was talking about the Dark Knight. It was literally a perfect movie. Never happens with that kind of hype. And, and here we were. So Batman uh, has resonated with me twice when the world was all on the same page and it's been it's been wild. That's a great one. I that dark the dark knight has held up so significantly it's well that even It's a perfect movie. I I argue it's yeah, perfect. That even when they did a re-release to theaters, I took my nephew to go see it and I recall it being quite busy for a movie that had been out and available for people to I don't know, probably stream or own mm-hmm. for so many years to see a theater that packed. It's because it it just it lived on in that experience where people who didn't get to see it in the theaters were like, I've loved this movie too. I want to see it in the theaters yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, on the, along the same lines, I think you have to talk about what it was like to do uh, all three Lord of the Rings films. You're, you're going into this three hour magnum opus at 12 o'clock at night not getting home till three 30 in the morning and still trying to go to work by 6 AM. I mean, everybody, everybody that Friday morning was all doing the same thing. That's true. That's true. Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Lord of the Rings. Oh, Oh, you more more coffee. (laughs) How rare though for it to happen three years in a row. I mean, basically it consumed our Christmases three years in a row. Right. And we weren't disappointed once. And the twilight fans can't say that shit. I can promise you that. And it, and only just because you also have like it's a, it's a different time. We had to like wait in line for tickets and wait in line for seats. Uh, Phantom Menace comes to mind as well as one of those things. Where wait in line, you had to get there early, man. Because if you didn't get there half an hour early, you're you're not got, sitting anywhere. For you Phantom want to. Menace, we got in line at six a.m. in the morning to buy the tickets when the theater yep. opened up at noon, and then after we bought the ticket, we immediately got in the next line, which was the line you sat in to get your seat. Because there were no assigned seatings back in the day. And the movie didn't start till midnight. So we were outside in 95 degree heat all day. And then pretty much like slept through the entire movie because we were so tired. What, what I think is amazing about Phantom Menace is I think the first time people saw it, they loved it. Based on the reaction stuff. I don't think people disliked that movie the first time they saw it. Yeah. I, it's I, like you know, the think- rewatch when the hype, kind of like Force Awakens, I think has that same effect, right? Like the hype dies down a little bit. You start to come back, calm down your your senses, and you're like, "What? Did, what just happened? What the fuck was Jar Jar, Exan? What was that? You agree or or no? You don't feel that way? Yeah, I, I think there were there were parts of Phantom Menace where you were kind of like, the pod race was definitely still too long, but at the same time, you're like, you're just you were into it because you're like, I don't know what to expect, and then you get to the end with the cool, you know, Darth Maul, Qui Gon, Obi Wan, dual light dual lightsaber, and the dual lightsaber came on, the whole theater like cheered like it was End Game. Because it was like, oh my god, it's two lightsabers! Like people just lost their minds. It was it was just a time that existed in a, in a, in that place and moment of just hanging out with people in line, talking to people in line, making good friends. You got to talk about it the next day with those people because you made good friends and changed numbers. I mean, you just you don't have that kind of a a fandom experience unless you're waiting in line at Comic Con for something that got canceled. It's true. 
Phantom Menace was wild. That was so exciting. People you, were pumped. People, people were, and, and it happened with Force Awakens again. I mean, people were. Yeah. It was really much. It was very much the a very similar feeling, and it just you know, unfortunately, Lucasfilm decided to make every Star Wars thing they could think of after that, and it kind of diluted all the excitement we had. Unfortunately, indeed. And really, just going back to to your thoughts on the whole Lord of the Rings experience. I mean, it's insane how that happened that way. I mean, people were so excited for the first movie for, for sure, but I just never expected the reaction that we got and that we were all on that same page each single year, like three years in a row after the first one came. I mean, the first one came out and everybody was a little, God, I hope they get this right. I hope you, you recreate the books as we, we hoped. I hope you, you know, create, Mordor and you really get us in the vibe and Gandalf and Gandalf the Grey and Gandalf the White are they going to pay homage they're going to be honorable to it and then we did it and it was so good people came back the next year and then the next year and to the point where by the time the third movie came you know I'll carry it for you we bought to no one and all of the tears that came they were earned everything was earned it had nothing to do with the books you never had to have read the books and that's impressive as hell to me because so many people uh, went to the first one because they read the books and told their friends and got more people to go and they just like fantasy stuff. And then by the third one, everybody is just on board because we all share this collective experience of loving these characters and their journey, right? which could have been solved in 30 seconds with these eagles just dropping the freaking thing off in the mountain. Awesome experience. Good, great pick. And it's amazing that it happened three years in a row. And I just totally stole all the talking points, but that's okay. <laughs> all right, Amanda, go ahead. My next one I'm going to bring up is one that didn't have a collective experience when the movie first came out, um, but has had a major collective, like unanimous, I don't know, society is just like super aligned on loving this movie. And I don't have an exact date of when that occurred, but I can tell you it's within the last 10 years, which is long after the movie came out. And that's Mean Girls. It's to the point where everybody knows all the quotes. Everybody still makes comments about yeah. on Wednesdays mm-hmm. where we we wear pink, and I don't it think just that seems qualifies. like why? Because it's not what we're talking about. It's not like a lasting impact. Because there's a lot of different movies that would impact. I'm saying at at one moment in time, everybody was on the mm. same page. Well, everyone was on the same page at one moment in time about <laughs> loving Mean Girls, <laughs> and it's still happening okay. today. All right, I think that's a stretch, but. That's we'll fine. I'll move to I'll move to my next one. Okay. Uh so the next one is Fast 7 and mm. this is the one where Paul Walker had died during the the filming of this film. Mm-hmm. And so when the movie released, there was not only just love and support and respect for the franchise and for Paul Walker and to go out and show out, but it was also I think for a lot of us, curiosity is to see what would happen with his character and what they were going to do to kind of wrap everything up. So that one, I remember, pro- I think probably every single Fast and the Furious movie, there was a group of people that I used to go see every single one of them with. And afterwards, everyone in the parking lot from that those sold out showings would be zoom, zoom, zooming, racing their cars away, even though they drive like a Honda Accord or something. Still do it with all the movies currently, but yeah, that was the <laughs> that was definitely the, the king of the hype for those movies. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, when you have one of your lead characters suddenly die in a tragic accident, like people are going to be morbidly curious to see what's going to happen and to see that person in their last uh, franchise appearance. Appearance. I know that's not the last movie he made, um, but it's still just that was a really bittersweet experience because it was kind of like you were also sending off Paul Walker as an an individual, as an actor. And I remember when they play the song and the car, the cars drive off in separate directions to signify like he's going his own way. Mm -hmm. And we no longer have Paul Walker as part of this. We no longer have Brian really as part of this as from Paul Walker. Um, You could hear the collective sobbing in the theaters. Like, Everyone was just in tears. And he was glowing. Yep. <laughs> and that yep. song. I like how they're still using that song in the movies today, by the way. Mm-hmm. The song just plays and everybody's like, oh, I miss Paul Walker so much. 
I anytime I hear that song, it's on my Apple Music, and whenever it shuffles on, I'm like immediately emotional because I think about it, and I'm like, oh, it's so sad. Wasn't it wild how Paul Walker was not ever really a super famous actor except for these movies? Mm-hmm. But man, people really missed him. Like they did like what they saw, you know. Yep, absolutely. That was a, that was a good time too. That was a cool time to see those movies. Like that was fun. It was. Even that was like the prime of movie theatering. Never thought I'd cry in a Fast and the Furious movie, but I bawled at the end, <laughs> like a baby. Hey man. Everyone, I'm telling you, every single person in the theater was crying. Don't take away Paul Walker and his skulls. <laughs> Don't take away skulls. Uh, all right, Trey, you're up. I oh, know I'm up. Uh, I'm up. I'm up. I'm up. I'm up. Um, yeah. Amanda, you talked about Jurassic Park, so I'll, I'll talk about that one. Uh, while you know there was something going on to bring you about the the actual Jurassic Park came out in I think June of '93, and oh, that's a really great month actually. Yeah. Well, <laughs> your parents definitely weren't humping to it then. So <laughs> it uh, it it was a a, a movie that. I think everybody was excited about because we hadn't seen dinosaurs really brought to life in that way. And everybody wanted to see that so bad. And then Steven Spielberg just freaking nailed it. And I mean, people were so excited for, for Jurassic Park. It was, it was insane. I mean, it became instantly iconic, but all your friends saw it opening weekend. So you were talking about, about, it seemed like anyway, and you were talking about it. And honestly, for a, for a long time going, it was an it was an iconic moment in time. It was it was just really wild. A Jurassic Park is just uh, one of one of my favorite memories. Uh, and I would tie since it's Spielberg, I'll also tie it into Crystal Skull, which is more ends on a negative, <laughs> but and I think really really did damage to the the Dial of Destiny that just came out, which was a very good movie. And unfortunately, a lot of people didn't want to see it because Crystal King, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. The hype was so exciting. People were wearing fedoras and whips and shit to the theater. They were stoked. I went with my entire family. Like, mom, dad, kids, da 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 Like, everyone went and saw the same showing. And unfortunately, the movie disappointed, but it was still a great moment in time. You know, it's just we all got to bitch at the same things at the same time. Swinging monkeys, what the fuck was that? You know, stuff like that. But same kind of moment, though. Revisiting it though, it's not as bad. Like they said, no, like revisiting no, Phantom not. Menace is actually not as bad as you think it is. It's just the CGI was just not proper for the time. They needed to wait a little bit to either do better CGI effects or just go back to practical effects or not have the effects at all and just do the scene differently. Absolutely. Um, Amanda, I don't know if you were around for this one, but there was one white Bronco that we just watched for hours drive down a highway. Yeah, I just watched it like two weeks ago on Netflix. <laughs> O.J. Simpson car chase. Everybody was glued to the TV to see what was going to happen to the white Bronco. Mm-hmm. No matter where they were. Now, when you're watching the TV series, Amanda, did, did you go back and look at the actual footage? Because I can't remember if they had the footage in that series. They show, Yeah, they show some of the actual footage. Um, but I did. I looked up the footage of... That and also him when he first when he gets to his house also and then pictures I saw from when he was handcuffed in his backyard. So they did have some of the, some of that. It, it was really, really well recreated in the film. And I they do insert like real shots. Um, but those are more like the aerial view, views that you see, I think. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I did look it up after, too. And you have to remember, this is like June 1994, so you would have been one year old, probably. Uh, I was. I was. But this is like pre-internet in people's homes. So Mm -hmm. we didn't have like YouTube to go look it up and watch it the next day kind of thing. Like this was a truly, as it happened, moment event. And at that time, this is all you know about OJ Simpson is what you see on the news or what you see in sports. And like, oh my gosh, like, what did OJ do? Like, OJ's an American hero. Like, this can't be going on. So yeah, it was just fascinating. And uh, what was even, I don't know if it was equal or on the same length or whatever, but the verdict, the OJ verdict. Yep. I mean, mm. people in at the office had their TVs turned to that channel for the ver- for the OJ verdict. It, it was wild. I bet. Work stopped. It was wild. Yeah, people were allowed to stop working and pay attention to TV. That never happened. 
It was it was such a monumental decision, though, I think, too. And because it was so publicized and it was so divisive in the country Mm -hmm. that it was like, no, this is important to you how this is going to what this is going to mean going forward, what this represents. And now because we have multiple screens, they just knew that you could keep working and watch Johnny Depp at the same time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I mean, you can tie that in, right? Uh, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard was kind of the same. Thing. Oh, my God. That's a good. Yeah. They I kind of rivaled how... OJ there for, for a while. That was insane. The memes. The memes are so great. Oh, God bless social mm. media. I can't believe they made a meme. (laughs) They made a meme for everything. Everything. Amanda, you're up. What do you got? Uh, My next one is related to Netflix's big launches. And and I know that this is, you know, it's not going to be like a midnight showing where everybody's there together. But House of Cards and then Orange is the New Black really is, is Netflix's assertion of dominance. And I feel like that's such an important moment in our entertainment history to to look back on and reflect at people truly binging TV in this new format for the first time for real. Um, and you think about how well that those shows did when they launched and what it did for Netflix. Like that, that literally changed the entertainment industry. It changed the TV industry. Mm-hmm. It it was the, d- the beginning of the demise of cable TV, like such an important. I mean, even if everyone was just glued to like this new TV show that was out and everyone was all excited, which they were. When you think about the the impact that that moment also had, it's it's insane. I think Lily Hammer was great. <laughs> Lily Hammer doesn't give enough love. I remember Lily Hammer. <laughs> What's funny is I think they started streaming like in 2007 or something like that. They did like Watch Now, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. But um, that was that wasn't that long ago. 15 years, 16 years. Yeah, I mean it hasn't been that long, and they have completely revamped. It's kind of like um, when we got DVDs versus videotape, right? I mean it completely revamped and like crushed Blockbuster, crushed a major corporation. 2013, February 2013. Well, they started doing it like uh, sooner than that, like 20, 2007 or something like that, because they had like a streaming service. Oh, the Netflix service itself. Yeah, yeah the service House of itself. Cards was 2013. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, they built up to it, but they launched originally in like 2007 or 8 or I think it was 7, 2007, something like that. And um, yeah, they, so they haven't been around that long. It's, it's, it's pretty well when you really think about it. It's, good, it's a good mention. Uh, Thank you. Sure. So I've got... Um, it's kind of weird when you think about it. Netflix, 07, and a year later, the iPhone. And the two of those things, like, yeah, ushered in the digital Ooh. revolution. Good mm-hmm. mm, good point. Ooh, I like that phrase. I've got uh, two comic book ones that really, really uh, hit me personally, but also the world was involved. And it was I was shocked that the world cared. Put it that way. Deadpool... Is this Spider-Man? Well, oh. hang on. Deadpool okay. is um, a character I thought only I really knew, and then I realized a lot of my friends knew, but really just geeks knew. And thank you, Ryan Reynolds, for making that one of the most popular comic book characters to come around in a long time, because everybody was talking about it when it finally came out, and the movie just like shot to the top of the box office and became instantly iconic and you know uh, basically changed how marketing works. Completely changed how movies are oh, man. advertised. Yeah. I mean, just across the board, revamped the whole system in in that respect. And it was just uh, phenomenal to see so many people loving a character that I never expected to be popular. Like, I really didn't. I just did not. He's not a good dude. He swears a lot. Uh, he's violent and he just doesn't give a shit about anything except whatever he's he's doing at that moment and it became super popular and ryan reynolds really made that character work i don't even know if that character can work without somebody just like ryan reynolds but that one worked i would agree with that the other one is yeah 2002 spider-man um people can't remember Mm -hmm. i don't think unless you were around when that came out i don't know if you could really see what that did 
for superhero movies because that's re- I mean, yes, X Men was a hit, and Blade did really well, but Spider Man launched superheroes into the stratosphere again of massive blockbusters. It became one of the biggest hits ever at the time. Had the biggest opening weekend at the time. It was over a hundred million dollars, which just didn't happen at that time. It was fun and nailed it as far as I was concerned. Nailed the character. Um, special effects were pretty phenomenal. It was just, and for me personally, you know, uh, my son's a diehard Spider-Man fan, so I got to see it with him, and that was really cool because I'd always wanted to see Spider-Man on the screen. I got to see it with fellow Spider-Man fan. That was really, really cool. It was just a, a great moment in time for, for me personally and the world because everybody that I didn't even know liked Spider-Man were suddenly Spider-Man fans. It was wonderful. That's really cool. That's really special. And it's back when they knew who Uncle Ben was, too. Oh, I knew it. I knew it was it coming. Was coming. Mm-hmm. It was only a matter of time. Remember that? Remember when Uncle Ben was part of Spider-Man lore? Before they just said, we don't need him. We just won't even mention him. We'll pretend, apparently, Aunt May doesn't even talk about her dead husband anymore. When when Spider-Man's origin story actually existed. I know. Yeah, because really the 90s was Batman, The Crow... And Blade. Damn, that was a good movie. Oh, that was the, that was like the entire history of the '90s for superhero for com- movies. For comic book, fan. yeah, for big big ones. Yeah, for big. big I mean, there's a yeah. few more in there, but they were more like graphic novels that right. were adapt- adapted and stuff. Yeah, Spider Man really. I mean, X Men did pretty well, but but Spider Man was huge, absolutely huge. Troy, back to you. What do you you got? Anything else before we wrap up here? Um, I mean, the Cheers finale, Mash finale. Those, Those finales, are huge, huge. yeah. Yeah. And there wasn't really, I think, anything that was equivalent to that. Maybe the Fresh Prince finale or the Cosby finale. Um, but Lost, I think, was probably the next big one after those monumental... Well, the Friends finale. Yeah. That one was in the middle. Man, there's a lot of big ones. Ma- so, yeah. I think Mash the Mash finale is still the most... The highest rated TV show of all time or TV series airing of all time or something like that. As far as like number of viewers watched? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's still number one. I did not do the, the math to look that up, but I could find out and report back in the group. Yeah, all of those, like it's just when you get when you get a fandom that just generates around a thing, I mean, just yeah, that, that we're closed at the end of the Cheers finale. It's just oh, oh my gosh. So good. So good. Um but I think it was the, Mash. The, the, 105 million. 105 point nine million people watched. Goodbye, farewell, and amen. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. They don't do that anymore. Watch TV at that. Certainly level. don't. Yeah. Um, but we did watch, I think, something that's really kind of moved the entire uh, Americana into this politicalness that we are today was the 2000, 2008, and the 2020 elections. Uh, if you remember back in 2000, that was the. I don't hanging- want to remember any of these. <laughs> <laughs> 2000 was the, we're never going to have a winner because the hanging chads in Florida and mm-hmm. Al Gore won the popular vote, but didn't win the electoral vote. And then that's kind of become the, the theme ever since uh, in the 21st century. Um, 2008 was the, you know, will a black president actually get elected? Uh, and everybody rallied around Obama. And, and then did. obviously 20, 2020 was a complete shit show. Oh, man. That's... Yeah, it got brutal. That's when politics got personal. Like For politics, sure. politics. I feel like used to be more personal between the candidates and not us to each other as much. Well, okay, let me backtrack because when Obama got elected, things got real personal. So I take that all back. That was the, that was the catalyst, in my opinion, for politics go to go really awry. But twenty twenty, obviously, things escalated even more. Well, even more what? so because a president is like stoking the fire of. Hundred percent derision. Yeah, and I think the difference in two thousand eight was that it became more political because the campaign for Obama knew exactly who they needed to target, which was the people that no usually vote. Right? Mm-hmm. It was the minorities. It was the younger generation. They really, lack of a better term, rocked the vote to get those people to the polls. And once you get people to the polls and involved in understanding what's going on, you're going to get a whole generation of different voices and opinions that are kind of fighting against the the stalwart of what America has been up until that point. And so why not rally around a black president to do it too? That'll really rile them up. And then everything just kind of changes from there. 
and how the entire political landscape moved forward. I mean, yeah. Yep. I hate to I mean, say the fact that, that we're true. still we're still living it right with Biden being Obama's VP and now Biden's in in the chair. Yeah, and and I'm sure we're gonna have a much easier go of the next election year. It'll be very smooth. I have no doubt. <laughs> it's gonna be a breeze. It's gonna be so smooth in a, in about <laughs> a year and a year from now. Yeah, uh, wake me up when the election ends. <laughs> right. <laughs> Please. Uh, that's, a, that's a new song. Wake right? me up when November ends. ends. <laughs> yeah, when, when November. Um, a couple of the ones that I still want to call out is Will Smith smacking Chris Rock. Oh God! Because man. when that happened, the, the viewership it just skyrocketed. Twitter was booming. Like everyone was collectively honed in on that moment people who were anti-oscars didn't care about the oscars it did not matter it was everybody had an opinion yeah everybody everybody had an opinion and what was amazing to me is if when you're watching it live they didn't show it in the u.s it's only from like on twitter where the whole video was shown because they if you remember when they when it aired they actually show chris rock getting up there and then it cuts like to after the slap when he's just like oh you know um Oh no! They showed the the slap aired on TV. No, it did not. No, it did not. Not when the I feed, feel like I, was, I remember it no, seeing you it. Did though. No, the feed, I the feed you I did not. I saw had him. Yeah, the feed I saw had him had no, him live because it was on a streaming service. AB, well, let's see. That might be no. ABC did not air it. <laughs> and you didn't you didn't get the conversation that happened after the slap. That's what they cut out. You didn't get the, the slap that. at all. The slap wasn't on there. It was I afterward. feel like I got the slap oh, no. because I was cooking while I had my laptop. I think up. people. This is revisionist history. Go back and you'll find out that it did not. They did not show it on there because they had the edit. They had a, an edit option in the U.S. It was only when the clips aired on Twitter from other countries that didn't edit it like that that it started circulating and people saw that that's what happened. Because when it first aired, nobody knew what happened. We were trying to figure out for the life of us what happened. Mm, okay. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I just I disagree. I remember vi- vehemently seeing it happen on my TV live because he walks up on stage and then he just kind of does the thing and you're like, holy shit, is this a bit like what's going on? And then it choppily cuts because you don't hear the like, don't you, t- you know, don't put my wife's name in your mother bleeping mouth. That's the part that cut out. I'm telling you the whole thing. You did not see it, but go ahead. But go ahead. Go go Google it while you're, while you're done listening to this podcast. Go Google it. And I'll bet you'll find that in the in the US, it was not shown. It was not shown the airing, the original airing. So on a happier note, Fight. Um, one that I honestly, I didn't even expect myself to get so wrapped up in because I'm not crazy about theater to, to the extent where I'm like, let me rush to my TV screen to watch this. Mm-hmm. But when Hamilton was released on Netflix. Yeah, that's a good one. If I, you said Netflix, I think you meant Disney Plus. It was on Disney Plus that Hamilton released. Sorry, go ahead. Wow, I've never and ever since then Hamilton has become even more popular and beloved because people we needed learned it what it was about. Yeah, and it was so fun and it was so funny and the music was great and it was so well shot for, you know, being a theater play and I just all of the things just made it really really cool and it was finally something cuz I believe it came out. Yeah, it came out during COVID. So we were all already stuck at home, kind of feeling very alone and isolated. Mm-hmm. All of us were. And here we had this moment where we could collectively like glee and have excitement over what was going on with this. And something that hadn't, at least to my recollection, has not been done before. No, and we weren't throwing so. away our shot. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Sorry. I pulled the Troy. Um, yeah, no, that, that's a that's a very good one. And it was it was kind of cool because that really did bring people together and got me to watch a play because otherwise I don't think I ever yep, would have saw it. Exactly. Uh, I also think we had that experience with Schitt's Creek during COVID. It had a boom where everyone was collectively enjoying yeah, it. Yeah, I feel like everybody watched that show at the same time. <laughs> like everybody just started watching it and finishing that show on the yep. same weekend or something. Mm-hmm. It was pretty wild. Uh, I will also, I want to throw a mention out Top Gun Maverick because I mean, last summer, man, that, that really kind of brought people back together in a big way. I mean, red, red, you're just talking about the split in, um, parties, Troy and Top Gun mm-hmm. Maverick was, a, was a movie that hit every quadrant and people were no matter which side of the fence you were on. Cause people were so divided these days. We were all on the same page for a couple hours. 
and going to the movies yeah. collectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, any more from you guys before? Because some listeners had some cool picks I wanted to mention before. Uh, Cubs World Series, talking about sports. Mm. Mm, uh, the rain delay one. speech for 17 minutes that changed the entire direction of the game. And then the Cubs win, and I woke up my wife because I was punching the bed trying not to scream, but I was super excited. <laughs> so I woke her up anyway. Um, you want to hear? Think- you want to hear a true story about the Cubs thing? Uh, I hadn't watched a Cubs game since I was uh, since my grandpa died because I, I used to watch them and go to them with my grandpa, and he died when I was nineteen, and I never watched a Cubs game after he died until the World Series because I always said if they go to the World Series, I'll watch them again for my grandpa. That's all. I, that's what I did. Did you watch all the World Series games or just, just that last game? Just the World Series games. I watched all of them, um, but I haven't watched since then. Um, and then I think the one that every American like pretty much knows about, regardless if you were alive at the time or not, was uh, the Miracle on Ice, the uh, semifinal match between U.S. and Russia in 1980. Oh, oh in 1980, right? Yeah. With Tanya. Huge. Huge. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't with Tanya Harding. <laughs> I was like, is that what he's referencing? That was much later. Much, much, much later. <laughs> I don't know dates. That was a miracle on ice, too, because that b- really brought attention to figure skating again. Yeah, it did. <laughs> I'm just saying, I thought that's what you were referencing, because I'm pretty sure everyone watched that. The, the movie was called Miracle for a Reason, Amanda. It was a miracle on ice. Okay. Man, Danny, wrap up it was once. 13 years before you, though. I, I understand. Everything was before me. No, that's all I had. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of other ones. Oh, there's there's, I, there's some cool ones. There's yeah. some that I'm like, I, I, I don't know if they would qualify. Like the series finale of Buffy, I felt like the world was with me and watching it. That's more of a you thing. See, that's a yeah, small I know. It's, I'm it, was like, pretty, it was pretty big. It wasn't like it was big, big, but, but what, it was big. Was the whole world really connected? I don't know if it was that deep. And the other one that came up in this was this could have been because I was so ingrained in that that community, that world was when Veronica Mars came back to Hulu. I started seeing people who had never even watched Veronica Mars started getting into the show and watching it because of that revival. And that was a really cool personal experience for me. Yeah, that's a smaller scale for sure. Yeah. But, but is you know. A big fandom that brought something back both for the movie and for the revival, Mm -hmm. but not the same type of thing as like the Friends finale. Yeah, for sure. Definitely not that. It's hard to compete with that or Seinfeld, honestly. Yeah. I mean, Seinfeld. that Seinfeld and Lost are very similar in that we're watched by millions. People were super excited for it. And it is so divisive even to this day. Like you either loved it or hated it. Same with Lost. You either loved it or hated it. Same, yeah, it was the same premise. You had to know what show you were watching to oh, appreciate geez, it or not. This, appreciate this it. again, I'm not, I'm not, I just can't with you. For both, Seinfeld uh, and that one. Uh, I would say the Stranger Things phenomenon and the Squid Game phenomenon. Both, again, Netflix, Juggernauts. Those are good. Yeah. And it came out of no, Squid Game came out of nowhere. But Stranger nowhere. Things, I mean, just look what it did. Even in season four, it, it created a song that everybody swears that they knew by heart. I've never heard before, but suddenly everybody's telling me that they're a huge fan of this singer. Um, and that song just like overwhelmed the world, which was, was insane. was not popular when it came out. Originally. No, I never even heard that song before. I was alive in the eighties and I listened to music. I never heard that song before. Never. Yeah, there were, there were people that uh, there were circles that really appreciated Kate Bush. I think depending on what type of music you liked, but Kate Bush was never like super popular. No, edgy, right? Yeah. Or it was punk. like it was like imagine imagine um ten years from now we get another moment like this and it's a Tori Amos song. Oh god. Like that's about the equivalent of what it would be. Treat me, treat me better, please. And I have to give fair credence to, you know, Troy's alluded to many, many times, the lost finale. I will say I think everybody was on the same page when that came out. And we're, we're excited about it. We're stoked for it. I remember we had a whole big event. It wasn't as big as the Game of Thrones uh, finale or anything like that, but hung out with friends to watch the Lost finale. And I just remember collectively going outside with um, Scott Clark, <laughs> former host of The Hollywood Outsider, and just raging about certain aspects of the show. And I'm, we're not going to get into that. I'm just saying it was, it was pretty phenomenal that we were on the same page <laughs> in many respects to how the finale played out. But there, that was a water cooler show. You talked about the water cooler earlier. That was a water cooler show where every person that 
uh, was involved in entertainment in some way seemed to have watched that finale. So it was a really, really cool experience to to uh, have collectively with the world at that time, regardless of how you felt it ended, you know. Uh, some listener comments. Jason West, he, he said, you know, the last time the entire family uh, saw a movie that they waited years for and it did not disappoint was Godzilla vs. Kong. Oh. And that was uh, that's interesting. the theaters and, and Max experience, right? Where they were simultaneously airing them both so people could see it at home or watch it in the theaters at the same time. So that's cool. Jennifer Miller, uh, Jaws created the summer blockbuster. Absolutely, it did. The original sure. Star Wars trilogy years, there was no fandom divide then. And the Harry Potter craze, which man already talked about. Uh, Nate Bruce, Game of Thrones, uh, the finale, Oberon versus the Mountain, Wow, we didn't even talk about Game of Thrones. That felt like it had several of them. There's, yeah, I was going to say there's yeah, so the many wedding, moments. How do you choose? The wall attack. Oh, man. Four. Winter, uh, the battle for, at Winterfell. A long night. A long night, yep. Tell him it was me. Or battle with the bastards. Oh, t- <laughs> tell her it was me. That's a good one. Dave the, Mc- opening of season, the opening of season seven when Arya gets revenge. Dave McGraw's got a really interesting one. I love how audiences rallied to try and ensure the twist and the sixth sense stayed a secret for everyone. Agree. That- that's an interesting one for sure. And that's true. I mean, nowadays people will spoil the shit out of something five seconds after they saw it. Troy can't help himself. He, you know, he basically will call me like, "Hey, guess what happened at the end of this movie?" <laughs> but you know, people news articles <laughs> do it too. That's like true. quote unquote journalists are spoiling in their headlines. You'll never believe the character that died. All right, let me guess: the guy that's in the headline picture. I, yeah, I, yeah. I wonder. Gee, who could it image. be? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see. Several of these we we already talked about. So let's let's see what we got here. Who shot Jr. Tammy Sparrow? Who shot Jr. Remember that one, Troy? Big one. Yeah. Yep. That it goes right along with uh, the Simpsons and uh, Who shot Mr. Burns? Yeah, I think and it was, cl- and that was clever because when when Maggie's pointing to the 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 compass and everybody's like, oh yeah, it's um, uh, Waylon Smithers because she pointed to the south and west, but it was actually Maggie Simpson. Or Burns was pointing, right? So Burns, Burns. But I think pointing. Who Shot Jr. was way more popular. Like, yeah, that but, was but it made it possible for Simpsons to do theirs, right? Because it was the same kind of throwback homage. And that's from Dallas. If you never watched the show, yeah. uh, Kathleen Donaldson. When I was a kid, we lined up around the block with hundreds of others to see The Exorcist at the local movie theater. That's true. That was a that was a huge juggernaut at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, a couple more. Mark Andrew, the reveal of Batman versus Superman at Comic Con. That's a good point, because when that was revealed, the world was ex- super excited. I mean, they went nuts. Unfortunately, the movie didn't deliver on the same excitement when it finally and came they out. they revealed that their moms were the same name, name. and it ruined everything. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara Harris. Oh, I like this. Uh, people stopped going to clubs to stay home to watch Miami Vice on a Friday night. It's true. And here, uh, here's another one. This is, this is true. This was a huge phenomenon. Marvin Sewell, Black Panther. That's a really good one. But that was pretty phenomenal. Wow, and that was a massive hit. Everybody was talking about it. I would oh. I would say the second one too though. Because after he passed away, it didn't rally like we thought they would though. Yeah, to have an entire season of Justified that tells me why. <laughs> I haven't even watched Justified yet. I can't get to it. I don't have time. Whatever. Make time, Troy. I'm making time on catching up on the other stuff I had to do before I got told to watch Justified. Black Panther was was such a phenomena. Such a phenomena. That's a lot of cultural events. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up. I would, oh, I would I would say this one for Amanda, right? Um the, Oh, he's picking them for you. He's mansplaining your own favorite memories. I know. I love when Troy does this. I'm just kidding, go ahead. This is like all of us, right? That that, that is it? still survive with the show, but uh the Denny Duquette and the Elved wire cut. I think oh, that was a that was a huge moment. The what in the early days of the Grey's Anatomy fandom? Oh, that was yeah. I have no idea what the hell you're talking. Or even about. the finale. But I I would say I would say that there's so many other moments that were more wild. Like I would say that probably the biggest collective watch would have been after McDreamy died. I would or, say that would probably be one of them. Or Meredith's hand on the bomb in the chest. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of really intense. Like, everybody has to have their eyes on this moment. The shooting, the plane crash. Yeah, the plane crash for sure. And the yeah. finale of ER. 
That's a good one. Really? The finale of the year? I mean, I, I didn't watch. I don't even it know. It was on the air for a long, like for the longest time, I swore that they were trying to keep Grey's Anatomy on the air purposely to beat the longest running streak of ER so that they could be the longest running medical show on TV. I mean, it's possible, I, I guess. But I don't know many people that were, I don't remember, I don't know if that one would count, but. Okay, so finally, wrap it up. What is your most special memory of a major pop culture culture event such as these uh, overall? Like, the the your favorite personal memory that if we ha- that we haven't already talked about other than diving into veronica mars i would say one that resonated deeper with me that probably didn't resonate for the same reasons with other people but it was still incredibly popular was the combination of wandavision and doctor strange it was Marvel properties, so people were really interested from that standpoint, and that's where the collective, you know, rallying came from initially. And then there was a lot of really great reception to the show, which led to, you know, some good positive momentum for the movie that came out after it. And for me, just seeing Scarlet Witch, you know, finally get some of that solo FaceTime where she gets to be a focal point was really, really cool. And I, I mean, any time my favorite female characters get to to be a badass in their in their way and we get to watch it for an hour and a half plus is always a win in my book. I mean, it was still number three for 2022. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Yeah, it was a huge movie. The juggernaut. Huge. OK, Troy, favorite movie, favorite memory that we haven't already talked about. That we haven't already talked about? Mm hmm. Oh, I don't know. I put all the ones down that I would be considered a favorite then clearly you didn't read the format and save one for the end (laughs) i'm just kidding i was too busy pacing them all in um i can't think of a new one because i went and saw back to the future 2 with my grandparents like they took us that was pretty huge all right what about you aaron well i did save them for last and uh it's they're connected which is why i have it as one memory but um, Infinity War, Endgame. Infinity War, because I was stunned that they killed off half half the characters. Half I the love. cast, and everybody was on the same page. Like we were all in, in all we were talking about it for my God weeks after that, and then Endgame came out, and we were all on the on the same hype train. I mean, I I don't, and, and I would actually put No Way Home. I would just wrap them all up there, like the. That kind of nostalgia fan moment, fan service doesn't happen very often when we were all just talking about the same thing. We were excited about the same things. Um, Endgame was 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 the best collective moment where all my friends were on the same page. No Way Home is my, my personal favorite moment just because Spider-Man is a huge deal to me and just having all three of them together like that and having that whole last ending and all those emotional moments and all that Andrew Garfield had his character redeemed and Tobey Maguire finally got to make his fourth Spider-Man and Tom Holland finally seemed like spider Like everything I loved was in one movie and everybody loved that movie. So that's you know, a good one. That's my personal favorite one. I should send you the, um, the rant that Carly had after infinity war. My daughter it was, it was, it's epic. What what was it? After Infinity War when they killed half the cast, like the rant that my daughter went on in the backseat of the car, I just I hit record on the phone for the voice recorder and just let her go. And it's a it's epic. That's <laughs> they, funny. They killed Spider Man. How did <laughs> they kill Spider Man? How dare they? All right. She was on, she was on fire. Well, guys, I hope you had fun. That was a lot of nostalgia, and I thought that was fun just kind of revisiting some of those, and I'm sure some of you have some of your own. Be sure to shout it out on social media, at Popcorn on Twitter, at The Hollywood Outsider on Threads and Instagram, and, of course, uh, we're on Facebook. We have our own group, The Hollywood Outsider. Just find it. It's a private group. TheHollywoodOutsider.com is our website, and that's going to do it for this episode. So thank you guys for joining me. As always, John isn't here we'll miss him but troy and amanda thank you for being here <laughs> always good times <laughs> i thought you were gonna say as always buy popcorn and, and then you went to i should have john i don't here. know why i'm still talking all <laughs> right remember the next time you head to a theater and have one of those moments again collectively or sit comfortably on your couch and have them while you're streaming tv buy popcorn <laughs>